Um, we're going to go straight into the message this day. And the title of the message is Christ of Our Best. Turn your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew chapter 27. We're going to start at verse 15. Matthew 27, verse 15 says, Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him, saying, Have nothing to do with that just man. For I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, what then should I do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? They all said to him, Let him be crucified. Then the governor said, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather than a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. If you notice that in this passage, Barabbas never speaks a word. But his name is found in all four of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We don't know much about him except for the few words that were written about him. Matthew 27, 16 calls him a notorious prisoner. Mark 13, 15, 7 says, he was in prison with other rebels and they had committed murder. Luke 23, 19 says, he was thrown into prison for rebellion and murder and John 19:10 adds that he was a robber when you put all of these scriptures together we find Barabbas was notorious he was dishonorable and he was disreputable he was a prisoner because of his criminal actions how many of us are prisoners of our wrong decisions, our wrong actions. He was a rebel, a thief, and a murderer. And in the eyes of the people and the courts that day, he was guilty. Barabbas was a guilty man. See, picture this. Barabbas is sitting in jail, waiting for his day of execution. He hears the jingle of the keys, the door being unlocked. Have they come for me already? He had spent the night in anger and in misery. Anger not at himself for the horrendous crimes he had committed, but anger because he was caught 
Isn't that like some of us? You know, we get angry because of our actions. We get angry because we were caught. He had played the horror of his death over and over and over in his mind. He could even already feel the pain of the nails piercing his hands and his feet. He could sense already the humiliation of the cross. He would be put on public display for all to see. Barabbas is thinking, is it my time already? The soldiers come, they pull him roughly to his feet. They bring him before Pilate. He stands before an unrelenting crowd. Thoughts just race through his mind. What's going on? There's Pilate and there's another man. He looks familiar. Pilate is speaking now. What is he saying? Whom shall I release? Release Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Christ. The people are shouting, release Barabbas, release me? What? I'm supposed to die. What's happening? What's happening? Who is this man the crowd is demanding to be crucified? But a thought shoots through his callous and confused mind. Better him than me. Better him than me. He starts, his heart starts to pound faster and faster and faster. Am I really going to be set free? His hands are released from the ropes that were binding him. The soldier tells him, go Barabbas, you are free. That man is going to die instead of you today. He can barely wrap his head around it, but he runs as fast as he can away from the crowd. I am free. Who is that man? Jesus was innocent. He had done no evil. Even Pilate saw this. He asked, why? What evil has he done? Yet, pressured by the religious elite, the people cry out, crucify Jesus. Release Barabbas. Turn your Bibles, if you will, to Isaiah 53. The prophetic word, Isaiah 53. We're going to start at verse 9, uh, verse 5. And he says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Jesus was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Verse six, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Verse seven, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. Do he, 
does he open not his mouth? He was led to a slaughter, and as a sheep is silent, he did not open his mouth. Verse 8, he was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgressions of my people he was stricken. Jesus was unjustly condemned and led away. No one cared whether he had descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. He was struck down for the rebellion of God's people. Jesus had done nothing worthy of death. If you read the same account in John, the Gospel of John, Pilate said three times, I find no fault in him. See, Pilate knew that Jesus had been turned over to him because of the jealousy and fear of the religious Pharisees and Sadducees. They didn't like the growing multitudes that were beginning to listen and follow Jesus. They didn't want to lose their control. They didn't want to lose their status. They didn't want to lose the power, their power in society. Their pride couldn't handle it. See, Pilate knew that Jesus had been turned away to him because of the jealousy of the religious elite. In the natural, the religious leaders were the instigators. But in the spiritual realm, the true unseen instigator was Satan himself. The devil worked through the avenue of the flesh. He worked through the selfish desires of this religious elite. But what the devil meant for evil, God turns it around. The devil didn't know that he was actually falling in line with God's plan of redemption. The religious leaders put Pilate in a difficult situation. Pilate's back was against the wall. He needed a way to escape this decision. So he came up with a plan. He was going to give the people a chance to do the right thing. A chance to release Jesus. Whom shall I release? Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Christ, he asked. I believe that Pilate selected Barabbas because he was probably the most dangerous criminal in jail at that time. After all, no one in their right mind would release the degenerate Barabbas over the submissive Jesus, would they? No one would choose a vicious and angry man over a loving and peaceful man, right? Wrong. Pilate's plan didn't work. Release Barabbas. Crucify Jesus was the demand from the crowd. God was speaking to Pilate's heart, but he turned a deaf ear. God even sent a dream to Pilate's wife. And she sent a message to him telling him to have nothing to do with Jesus. She even called Jesus a just man. But Pilate did not heed God's voice because he couldn't identify God's voice. Pilate did not believe in the God Almighty. Jesus says, my sheep know my voice and they follow me. Pilate's problem was that even if he knew of Jesus, he didn't know Jesus. He didn't have a relationship 
with them. When we don't know Jesus, when we don't allow an intimate relationship to develop with him, when we keep putting him on the back burner, when the time for difficult decisions come, we will falter because we cannot identify his voice. Doubts will come flooding in and the devil's voice will whisper, has God indeed said, all things are possible with him? This is why, as children of God, we need to be conscious of the life of Christ in us as we abide in him just as he abides in us. Decisions will not be a problem. Just let Jesus take the wheel and his life will flow out through you. Amen? Amen. I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. See, the truth was right before Pilate's face. Jesus was a just man who was being unfairly persecuted and prosecuted. But Pilate wasn't strong enough to stand up to the religious leaders and the crowd. He made a political and popular decision because he lacked the courage to act on his own conscience and convictions. Pilate represents all of us who back down when persecutions come. Think about it. Peter, his disciple, denies him three times. And they had spent time with Jesus. His other disciples deserted him in his hour of need. Sometimes we make the decision to be popular instead of righteous. We put our personal well-being before the gospel of Jesus Christ. We put self before Christ. Isn't this the truth? I'd like you to turn to Matthew 13. Matthew 13, 18 to 23. It says, therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet, he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, because of the word of God, immediately he stumbles. Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares, the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. We want our soil of our heart to be a good soil that receives the word of God. See, by his grace, the Holy Spirit can place into our hearts the desire to cultivate a deeper relationship with Christ, to spend time with him through prayer and the word of God so that 
We will desire to stake our lives for the sake of the gospel, no matter the cost. See, as we are conscious that our roots are in Christ, that our roots are in the gospel, the word of God will get a hold on us and the Holy Spirit will fill us with Christ's love and boldness. But are we willing to stake our life for Christ? You know, here in, all of us are special people, but today we have actually two people who are involved in a missions program. There is Jeff, what program are you in? Uh, Inner CP. They send out missionaries. And the other one is Jordan Okaji, who is right now enrolled in YWAM. I'd like to call them actually both up here. See, Jordan started school with YWAM last week, but she was granted grace and she's able to be here with us. She's gonna go through three months of training and she's gonna be sent to Brazil for three months. Yours not decided yet, or is it Turkey? Turkey, end of July? He's also in the program. What a blessing. The young in Christ. Pastor Rod? Okay, if you would just stretch forth your hands. We're gonna pray for these two young people who the Lord's hand has grabbed, the Lord's word has grabbed a hold of. I'm going to ask Pastor Rod if you can pray over them because apparently my voice is going and i got to finish the message. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. <coughs> Father, you've called these precious youth into the ministry. There's a stirring in their hearts to go into the fields that you've put and placed upon their hearts. And God, we, we lift them up this morning. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you are leading and guiding them by your Holy Spirit. And Lord God, for this purpose, they shall go forth and you'll open up their eyes and they'll be able to see all those that are needing Christ in the fields. So we thank you, Lord. We, we commit Jordan and Jeffrey into your hands. Lord, you have raised them up for such a time as this. We come against any assignment that would stop the move of the gospel upon their lives. And we thank you, Lord, that they would hold on to the covenant of the blood, the sacrifice of Christ, the Son of the living God. And God, wherever they go, may they declare, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And upon this confession, O oh God, you declared that you will build your church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And Lord God, you have given them the keys to the kingdom of heaven to go forth, Lord God in your power, in your might. So we commit them into your hands, Lord, and we will commit this morning a prayer covering over our brother and sister. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for these true missionaries that will be going forth in Jesus' name, making disciples of many that they will come in contact with. So we love you, Lord, and we give you all the praise and all the glory. In the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And everyone said, Ascent. Amen and amen. Love you guys. Oh, back to the message now. I'm going to take a sip of water. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus said, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Our cross is the cross of Christ, where love won out and victory was proclaimed. Amen? Amen. On the cross, Jesus declared, it is finished. He completed the work the Father sent him here for. In the end, back to Pilate. Pilate gives in to the will of the people, but tries to exonerate himself, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. 
he calls Jesus this just person. You see to it. And then the people answered and said, his blood be on us and on our children. There's a man, Minister Thomas Whitelaw. When he wrote about the crowd's choice of Barabbas over Jesus, he mentioned seven words that summarizes that momentous moment. Number one, it was popular, but the popular choice is often wrong. Number two, it was frenzied, when passion rules, judgment dies. Number three, it was criminal to prefer a murderer over the prince of life. Number four, it was foolish to choose an enemy and to reject a friend like Jesus. Five, it was fatal in that it guaranteed judgment to the nation. Number six, it was predicted in Isaiah 53, three and seven. It was overruled by God to bring salvation to the world. When the people chose Barabbas over Jesus, what they did was they embraced sin and rejected the righteousness of God. God's own people acted in ignorant hostility. They disrespected God's son. Isaiah 53 says, he is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. John tells us he came to his own and his own did not receive him. Israel was always a rebellious people, but never before had they treated the Lord with such contempt. Never before did they treat him like he had no that. But here's a thought for you. Inasmuch as the Israelites rejected Jesus that day, we also reject Jesus time and time again. When we go our own way, when we don't want to heed the voice of God,
Jesus had died on the cross just a few days earlier, and after he had died, he was buried in a tomb. His family and friends were very sad. His family and friends missed him very much. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene and some other women went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been rolled away. This astonished them, but there was something even more astonishing. The body of Jesus was not in the tomb. Mary came running to tell the disciples. She spoke with two of them named Simon Peter and John. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Simon Peter and John started for the tomb. Both were running, but John outran Simon Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, John, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed, but they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside of the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They spoke to her. They have taken the Lord away, and I don't know where they have put him. <laughs> Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where he have put him, and I will get him. Mary. Have a not hold on to me, for I am not yet ascended to the Lord. Go and said to my brothers and tell them, I am not yet ascended to the Lord, and your Lord, to my God, and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I am seeing the Lord. And she told them all the things that he had said to her. Now Jesus' friends didn't have to be sad anymore. Now they knew that Jesus was alive forever.
2,000 years ago, we were responsible for putting Jesus on the cross. It was our sins that put the nails into his hands and feet. But you know, the wondrous thing is, it was his love for us that kept him on that cross. Jesus willingly sacrificed himself. He wasn't forced to do it. John tells us, therefore my father loves me because I laid down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my father. Barabbas. I listen to the tape all night, but I still get it wrong. Barabbas. I listen over and over. Barabbas. Barabbas. In my dreams, I kept saying Barabbas. Barabbas. I go back to Barabbas. Barabbas. You know, you gotta soak in the right thing, right? Barabbas was guilty. Jesus was innocent. Barabbas was a murderer and a thief. Jesus is a giver of life. Barabbas was in darkness. Jesus is the light. Barabbas lived. Jesus died. A sinner was set free. A sinless and righteous man died. There's a very old hymn named, O Sacred Head Now Wounded. And in that hymn it says, My Lord, what you did suffer was all for sinners gain. Mine, mine was the transgression, but yours the deadly pain. So I kneel, so here I kneel, my Savior, for I deserve your place. Look on me with your favor and save me by your grace. See, many of us think that we are pretty good or at least not as bad as the, as the next person, right? We haven't done atrocious things that would send us to jail, but we haven't lived a sinless life either. We've lied, we've cheated, don't you guys lie now. We've gossiped, we've gotten angry and impatient, we've made accusations and blamed others for our problems. Yeah, see, it's always Russell's fault. <laughs> and the list goes on and on and on. You know, some, of us, some of us sitting here may be even thinking that Barabbas is evil because he was a criminal. But we are good because we are not like him. This thinking is wrong, but that's how we think. That's why we need to renew our minds. Every one of us is either right now Barabbas or we were Barabbas. If we don't have Christ, we are Barabbas. If we have accepted Christ, we were Barabbas, past tense. In the light of the cross, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. We were like Barnabas. Amen? But there's good news. Just as Jesus took Barnabas' place on the cross, Jesus also took our place on the cross. This is the great substitution. This is the great exchange. This is God's grace. Christ became our substitute when he died in our place on the cross. 
he exchanged his righteousness for our sinfulness. He became a curse for us so that we could be made free from the law that demanded that we all be put to death because we all sinned. Barabbas was allowed to go free with no condemnation because Jesus replaced him. We were set free with no condemnation because Christ replaced us on the cross. We deserve death, but Christ gave us life and life everlasting. And he reconciled us to the Father in heaven. 1 Peter 3.8 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. See, through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, and we were condemned. But through one man's righteous act, Jesus Christ, the free gift came to all men. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. You know, and I think, I wonder what happened to Barabbas. Did he go back to a life of crime and rebellion? Or did he eventually become a follower of Christ? Romans 2, 4 tells us, God is wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient with us. His kindness is intended to turn us away from sin because it is the goodness of the Lord that leads us to repentance. It's the goodness of the Lord that causes us to change our thinking. It's the goodness of the Lord that does a work in our heart. After he was released and the days of the events began to sink in, I would like to think that Barabbas was thankful for his freedom. Jesus was condemned to die as his substitute, a just and holy man in place of a murderer and a thief. I would hope that his heart was now open to the gospel of the kingdom of God. The Bible never tells us what happens to Barabbas. We're just left with questions to think about. Perhaps God left this story incomplete to make a point to us. Think about it. A person has two choices. He can surrender himself to Christ and be thankful for what he has done. Or he can reject Christ and continue to live his life separated from God with no true purpose and with no true happiness. Barabbas was saved from death, but the cost was the life of the Son of God. This is a picture of divine grace. Now, when Barabbas thought of Christ, he could truly say, he died for me. This day, whenever you think of Christ, do you believe and truly say, he died for me? me. Amen. We're going to come to the conclusion of this message now. When we look at Barabbas, we have a glimpse of our guilt which deserved death. And we have a preview, a preview of the grace of God which was released at the cross so we could be set free. Jesus was delivered to death. Barabbas was released to a new life. The innocent Jesus condemned as a sinner, while the guilty sinner Barabbas is released as if he was innocent, while Jesus' death sentence led to the physical release of Barabbas from captivity. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross led to the spiritual release of many many, many captives from all over the world. But the story 
of Jesus Christ does not end with his death on the cross or even with his burial. Turn to Luke chapter 24. certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Song after song today, we heard death could not hold you. You are the risen king. See, Calvary expresses the love of God. But the resurrection explains the power of God. And the last time we hear a reference to Barabbas is in Acts 3, 14 to 15, when it says, But you denied the Holy One and the just, and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. The Old Testament tells us, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. <coughs> Who do you want me to release to you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ. Barabbas represents unrighteousness. He represents selfish desires. Christ represents righteousness. Christ is righteousness. Remember, when we reject righteousness, that means we're accepting unrighteousness. Scripture tells us, do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to, you obey? You are the one's slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. The gospel is simple. Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he rose the third day. On the cross, Jesus exchanged his life for ours. And as children of God, we stand now righteous and forgiven. We are new creations who have been freed from the curse of sin and death. We now have life everlasting in him. When Jesus Return to the Father. He sent down the Holy Spirit to now live in his believers. We are not alone. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And now we can say, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So today, we have the good news. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. If there is anyone here today who doesn't know Christ, but wants to have a relationship with him, 
who wants to be reconnected with our Father in heaven. If you would just follow me in this prayer. As I say the words, if you would just repeat after me. And brethren, if you would also follow suit. With all eyes closed and heads bowed. Just say this simple prayer. Heavenly Father, I open the door of my heart. And I invite you in to be my Lord and Savior. All the things, all the sins I've committed, I give unto you, O oh God. Forgive me. Let your life come live in me. And let me heed the voice always of the Holy Spirit. Let me live by faith in your son. Lord, I thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. I believe that you died and that you rose the third day. And in you, Christ, I believe I died and I rose with you in the newness of life. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. Thank you for life in you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And now if you've said the prayer, welcome to the family of God, because now you are a child of God. Hallelujah. It's our hearts. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this awesome day, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice. But we thank you also for your resurrection. You have resurrected our lives. Not only resurrected, you have given us a new life in you, Lord. And we stand just poised, posed, Lord, ready to be sent out by you. For out there are nations that need the gospel, Lord. You're sending all of all different ages now. So, Lord, let that be our heart cry. Christ. Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And upon you, our church is built. Upon you, our life is built. And we thank you this day in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said a resurrected. Amen. 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 Turn to your neighbor and say, my God's not dead. My God. While, while we're getting ready for our service and all you've been...